Okay, we should be starting really now. Unfortunately, there's good and bad news. The good news, the party last night at Jen's place was really good. The bad news is no Jen. <laughs> so uh, I left early and at 5 a.m. or something about that. So I have no idea where she is. I, and I'm not sure whether she, she will turn up but I'm pretty sure she will be with us tomorrow morning. So, welcome to the Lightning Talks on the 23rd Communication Congress here in Berlin. This is room two, between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. That's for the people outside or for those who will listen up later from the recording. Hello, guys. So, today's, on today's agenda, we have uh, nine talks. If we get through them real fast, we might have time for one or two more. So be prepared if you want to show something. Right, we will start off first talk with uh, Matthias Manze, and he will tell us something about the Wikinet. What is the Wikinet? What is the Wikinet? The Wikinet is a proposal for all wikis to collaborate. The Wikinet is supposed to apply to all wiki engines and all wiki engines can be modified in order to support it. For my proposal I use the Oddmuse Odd, uh, wiki engine. When starting in wiki there, is, there are always other wikis dealing with something similar already. We will call them neighboring wikis. Note that the task of defining which wikis are neighbors is entirely with the community. The likelihood of a collaboration between your community and the communities of neighboring wikis is high. Defining a neighborhood for, a wiki, for wiki communities <coughs> is in practice already for some years in the form of the wiki node. Many wikis have a page called wiki node. On the Wikinode, you find links to the Wikinode pages of neighboring wikis. This is where these wikis again define their neighborhood and so on. Hello? Yeah. The Wikinet changes. Um, to see what is going on in your neighborhood still requires too many steps. Instead, there can be a page, Wikinet changes on your wiki showing your local recent changes merged with the recent changes of the few most interesting wikis. Even easier would be to have a, summarize, a summary for the public created by the community on day pages that are gathered together on a page called blog. The blog is also displayed at the bottom of the front page. The blog is also syndicated to other wikis. Wikinet blogs. The page Wikinet blogs shows both the local blog and the blogs of the community most interesting, the currently most interesting neighbors. This allows you to see what is happening in your neighborhood without having to leave your wiki. You and everyone in your community can dynamically shape this common fisheye view, I call it. The interesting part about, actually, is the, the interference between two different Wikinets. The global brain we are about to build, it seems to me, will be able to see things both in large scale and in detail, sharp at the same time. It focuses on individual people, personal wikis, and on communities, community wikis. We want to be automatically notified when another wiki starts or stops to watch our wiki, feeling the other's gaze on your skin. That is an expression we use for it. This is a little harder and takes us to the local page Wikinet and to the Wikinet server. The, the, 
the day page who helps here is for documenting who currently makes part of the community. It's another day page set. The day page set Wikinet puts out a feed containing the current information about the state of mind of a wiki community. Who is in the co community currently, is the community currently composed of and what neighbors is the community currently interested in. Today wikis are like that. You enter a community, you start to understand what the idea is and after a while you get that person A is also busy on your second favorite subject, su subject Person B does what a good friend of you does, but in French. Person C is rarely around, but busy with something pretty interesting you never ever heard of before, and so on. What about having all this information even before entering a community? Thank you. Letzte Minute, letzte Minute. Oh, okay, I cut him off, I'm sorry. So, he, he's done. Thank you very much for showing us the Wikinet. Yes, not only Jen is not here, also her sounds from her laptop are not here. So I brought a substitute. When you hear this, um, I will do it a little differently. It's last half minute, so it's probably less distracting. Last half minute. Anyway, so after you will have the second talk from uh, Benjamin Kellerman now. Where is he? No, oh, there he is. Good access from here, no? Okay. So please get connected to show what's up. This will be about a new lay keyboard layout. So if you get fed up with uh, US layout, German crowd layout, or the Dvorak, everybody has Dvorak these days, there's a new one, and that's why it's called Neo. So the, here it is. Take it away. Ja, hallo. Also das ist nie ganz neu, das ist jetzt schon zwei Jahre alt, aber immerhin. Äh, also Kuverts kennt ja jeder, das ist ja schrecklich. Ähm, daran wollen wir uns gar nicht messen. Äh, es gibt, also für alle nochmal so eine kleine Einführung in die Geschichte. Das Kuverts Layout wurde von Scholz entwickelt, irgendwann 1800 noch was. Äh, dabei ging es darum, ein Layout zu entwerfen für die Re Schreibmaschine, für die Remington Schreibmaschine. Und äh, das Layout war darauf, äh, es gab auch mehrere Layouts, die im Vergleich gezogen wurden. Äh, das Layout war dann allerdings optimiert darauf, dass sich die, äh, die Anschläge der, der, ähm, der Tastatur dort nicht verhaken. Also darauf ist es optimiert. Das heißt, man hat versucht, häufige Buchstaben möglichst weit voneinander entfernt zu legen auf die Tastatur. Ähm, das ist nicht unbedingt ganz schlecht ergonomisch gesehen. Man hätte es auch noch schlechter machen können, aber es ist auch nicht unbedingt ganz gut. Es gab dann in 30er Jahren von dem Herrn Dvorak, was ein, äh, irgendein Vetter von dem Dvorak, von dem Komponisten war, der allerdings in den USA lebt, weshalb man das Dvorak spricht, äh, von dem gab es dann eine, ein neues Layout, das Dvorak Layout, was relativ bekannt geworden ist, das, was sich allerdings auch nie durchgesetzt hat, in 30er Jahren war das. In 70er Jahren gab es dann vom Marsan institut nochmal eine Überlegung, da, haben, da wurde versucht, ein europäisches Keyboard Layout zu machen, also ein Keyboard Layout, was in, für ganz Europa funktionieren sollte und was alle befriedigen sollte sozusagen. Und jetzt, ähm, 2004, kommt also unser Layout, das Neo-Layout, und wir haben äh, versucht, das speziell auf das Deutsche zu optimieren. Man sieht das, äh, man sieht das hier, die, die Hauptzeichen, also U, I, A, E, sind ähnlich beim Dwarrack, auch alle auf der Grundreihe. Äh, dann hier ist das Bekannte, was man immer aus den Shows kennt, das Ernstel ist hier drumherum geordnet, also E, N, R, das sind also alle wichtigen auf der Grundreihe, die Buchstaben. Und die häufigen, die ordnen sich dann drumherum. Das äh, bezieht sich auch auf die bekannten Erkenntnisse, dass man versucht, möglichst oft abzuwechseln die Finger, also möglichst viel hin und her zu tippen. Die häufigen Buchstaben auf der Grundreihe, also E, N, als die häufigsten Buchstaben, auf die Grundreihe zu legen und die eben möglichst abzuwechseln. Wenn man auf eine Hand schreibt, dann sollen möglichst abrollende Bewegungen, wie beim IE, dass man den Finger eben abrollen kann, äh, abrollende Bewegungen genommen werden und ja, ansonsten eben wechselnde. Okay, ich habe dann mal hier ein Programm. Das Schöne ist, ähm, das Ganze ist schon in das Programm K-Touch für Linux, äh, gibt es ein Tastatur-Lernprogramm, da ist es schon integriert. Also man kann das hier einstellen äh, in den Keyboard-Layouts. Oh, ist schwierig, ja, so, genau, und da kann man das also einstellen hier. Und äh, ich habe das mal jetzt häufige Bigramme genommen, damit man sieht, wie das ist. Also das sind hier äh, von Wikipedia die häufigsten Bigramme. 
Und die habe ich einfach mal genommen, damit man sieht, wie, wie das Ganze mit den häufigsten Bigram durchgeht. Also man sieht immer, der blaue Buchstabe ist der, der gerade getippt wird. Wir haben also hier das ER, das ist also beides auf der Grundreihe, EN auch auf der Grundreihe. CH ist ein Ausreißer, aber beide wechseln die Finger. Dann DE, EI ist dieses besagte Abrollen. IN, TE ist also immer, alles auf der Grundreihe wird geschrieben, die ganzen häufigsten, also zumindest viele. Okay, wir können das Ganze jetzt mal vergleichen, auch wenn das wirklich kein doller Vergleich ist, mit ähm, dem normalen Kuverti layout da sehen wir, der häufigste ist, also hier, oh, ach, jetzt muss ich ja natürlich meins tippen, okay, dann haben wir EN, ist also auch nie auf der Grundreihe, CH, wer hätte es gedacht, DE ist sogar ein Doppler, hier sieht man das, ne? da muss ein Finger springen für DE, EI, ja, IN, wann kommt endlich das erste, was man auf der Grundreihe tippen kann, naja, es ist auch fies, es ist so ein bisschen wie wenn BSD sich mit Windows vergleicht, die vergleichen sich ja auch mit Linux, ne? ist ja klar. So, deshalb müssten wir unseren Vergleich eigentlich lieber mit, mit dem englischen Dwarik machen, das ist das Ganze auch schon besser, allerdings sieht man hier, ist es auch nie aufs Deutsche optimiert, also das R zum Beispiel ist eben nie so häufig, dafür ist das TH so äh, ein bisschen häufiger, das ist hier nebeneinander und hier sieht das Ganze schon ein bisschen besser aus, also ER, achso, ja, ich muss ja hier tippen, EN, ach, CH, ja, CH ist hier nicht ganz so gut, aber gut. Ach, wo sind wir da oben? CH. Äh, DE ist also dort, da muss der kleine Finger ein bisschen springen. Also man sieht, das ist zwar besser, es ist öfter auf der Grundreihe, aber, ähm, ach, das ist verwirrend, wenn man ein anderes Layout sieht. Als, okay, also da sieht man, das ist schon besser, aber es ist wirklich auch nicht so ganz optimal. So. Das ist das Erste, also man sieht, da hat man Vorteil, das kann man jetzt noch an weiteren Tests machen, mit den Trigrammen oder mit den häufigsten Wörtern. Okay, letzte halbe Minute. Was wir jetzt noch gemacht haben, ist in letzter Zeit, wir haben uns noch, weil viele nehmen ja das qwerty layout nur weil die Zeichen, die Programmierzeichen besser sind. Was haben wir also gemacht? Wir haben die Alt-GR-Ebene genommen, die man sonst immer nur für das Add-Zeichen kennt. Das Caps Lock, was man sowieso nur braucht, um es zu drücken, falls man mal es versehentlich gedrückt hat, um es wieder auszuschalten, haben wir ganz entfernt und hier noch ein Alt-GR draufgelegt und die ganzen häufigen Zeichen hier angeordnet. So. Und extra noch versucht, das Ganze äh, auf Bigramme zu optimieren. Also ihr Tilde Slash, der Doppelpunkt ist gleich. Ne? So, und das Ganze dann, dann haben wir noch eine fünfte Ebene eingeführt. Ach ja, Trigramme haben wir auch optimiert, ne? Das sieht. Okay. Thank you for that. Looked really interesting. I want to see more, but five minutes is five minutes. So there you go. Yes, and I would like to ask every speaker to say, uh, how are you going to be reached? So please do not forget to, to say something about that. Uh, so I, I just have it for you. If you want to reach him, uh, he must be over there after the talks, if you want to talk to him. All right, Benjamin? Neo 2, so N-E-O 2, uh, type that on the deck phone and you reach him. So next on the list, that's Bela, are you ready? Good, this is about Tin Boy, please tell us about Tin Boy. <laughs> Hello, my name is Barbara Klein, uh, also Bela. And I want to um, introduce her, a proposal of her idea for an open source project I have. So this is about a new note-taking application. What's new about it? Um, I want to combine the simplicity of a text editor. Just, you just jot down some notes in a text editor, very easy to use, um, quick startup. Um, combined with uh, some sophisticated means of organizing the, um, the notes. I want to do that with types. I think our typing system, class system is, is clear to everyone. Also use ling, uh, sorry, tags, like in delicious or something to, to annotate, to tag the object. And of course, uh, um, links. It will be a, a wiki type linking, which is also known in the note-taking application of Tomboy. And um, I want to introduce a new concept I call Agile Information Organization. So this is an example Tinboy file. It's a very simple format. So the idea is you can really, if you just want to note something down, you can start editing a simple text file. And you can add, um, 
key value pairs to it. So you can just start noting something down and then you type title, colon and the title, type and the type and if you want to add some text to it. And of course, apart from these three elements, title, type and text, you, you can add any element you want. Like I have the example of a, of a talk here, of an, um, no, of the Congress. If I have the idea I want to put down that it's uh, taking place on the BCC, I can add a new slot for that. Um, this is a very early screenshot. This is going to be an Eclipse plugin, um, developed in Java, of course. Um, so what it does, it uh, gives some color to it. You have the title here, the type, and the text, and then all the slots you have in the node. And the idea of the Agile information organization is that you, if you have a new idea for the slot, you don't have to go somewhere and add a database um, field or something. You can just a enter a new slot there as, as it comes into your mind. And it will have um, some reflection modes. Like if you, for instance, I've been on a, a conference and I took my notes for the single talks with this thing. And in each talk, you have an idea for a new slot you might use. You want to note something special. You just do it. And after that, you have a tool. I call it reflection tool because you reflect on what you have been done, um, which shows you which slots, which fields did I actually use for this type of node. And then you can decide, OK, this was a good one. This was an idea I used just once or actually never and discard it again and develop the, the actual model of the nodes out of the experience you already have with those. So this is the idea of Agile information organization I want to support with that. Um, so we will have also for navigation some, uh, if you know Eclipse, this is just a standard um, perspective in Eclipse. So you usually have some kind of hierarchical organization, might be um, type inheritance structure or whatever. Uh, and of course, a table overview, which is uh, common for problems or tasks in, in other Eclipse um, applications. For instance, showing you all the nodes for a certain type or filtered by text, etc. Um, I got some more ideas. I started programming, I, and these are very far away ideas in the moment. Uh, I work also with a mind mapping tool, FreeMind. Some of you might know that. Also, Java open source um, software. Uh, it would be nice to integrate that to have other means of um, of creating a hierarchical or, um, structure, which uh, mind mapping does. Uh, LaTeX, uh, LaTeX export. Uh, I'm thinking about format, formatable text, but it clashes with a simple file format, even if you just put HTML in there. It's not as easy to edit. Um, possible integration of other file types, uh, pictures, etc., with links, and uh, which is very easy with Eclipse to do extension points for custom exports, so it's easy to write and export with some Java classes. This is half a minute, right? Okay, so um, this is pre-alpha phase. I, um, I asked for a SourceForge project for it. It will be, as I said, Eclipse plugin. I decided for the MIT license, which basically can say, do whatever you want, uh, but I'm not, uh, uh, I forget the word. Um, it was not my fault if something goes wrong. Um, I have the domain tinboy.org. You find some information there. Um, and uh, please contact me. I, I really want to discuss this. Um, any contributions, questions, anything, contact me via this means. And I also have the event phone, I think, uh, 6339. 39. Thank you so much. Time's up. Thank you. Die Domain? Okay. So, nicht, dass so ein paar domain hier sind. Uh, right, next on our list. Uh, this is about the $100 laptop. So, please get connected. And uh, special greetings to the guys watching out there. I 
my instant messenger tells me there's somebody out there. Actually, we planned for uh, an IRC channel for you guys to comment on this stuff so we can get uh, instant feedback, uh, log this, and um, yes, there's some more. If you do have feedback, please give it to me. Uh, at oh, We will show this later. I'm really looking forward to this. We have to improve. So uh, it'll be 23C, 23C3 at gookus.net. So, you ready? I am. Here goes, five minutes. Okay, so my name is Bert Freudenberg. Um, I'm working in the old PC project. Okay. Uh, in the old PC project. This is one of the few hundred prototypes. Um, there are actually at least two in this building. Um, there's one more machine up at the Wikipedia uh, booth um, where you can take a closer look. Um, I just set it to running, I think. Okay, and then let's see if it boots in five minutes. Um, <coughs> <laughs> so the, the old PC project is actually about education. Um, so the, um, it's a project to get um, the possibility to get educated to the children of the world. Um, there are a few countries that already agreed pretty much to, uh, to get one of these machines. Um, they are only sold in millions um, to get the coast down. Um, so everything that's green on this map um, is countries that have agreed in the past, um, and if I could scroll to the right, you would notice Thailand over there, uh, where just uh, there was a military action that might have thrown OPC uh, back a bit. Um, but that's the problem that you have when, when you deal with, with countries. Um, so, but, but I won't talk too much about the education stuff. There is an other uh, lightning talk tomorrow, which is about hacking education, which is pretty cool. Um, and these laptops are um, supposed to be used, uh, for example, as a textbook. Printing textbooks is not exactly cheap, and they have a like, life expectancy of five years. Um, so printing textbooks for five years is almost about $100, uh, even so that this machine currently is a bit uh, more expensive. It's about 100 euros, uh, so we should rename the machine. Um, we have a, a development environment running um, here, which does not work because I'm running an 800 by 600, I think. Um, so uh, one of the uh, cool things about the laptop is that it has a display uh, that's 1200 by 900 and you can see the actual size, it's 200 dpi, so that's optimized for, for printing text in almost print quality. Um, it's really sharp, you should take a look uh, at it. Um, the development environment is, it runs on simple Linux, um, I'm running uh, Fedora here in, in an emulator, um, so you can just grab the disk image from a server, uh, laptop.org is the uh, main uh, URL for, for the project, um, where you can get involved. There's only open source software on that machine. There are one or two few uh, uh, parts still missing, but that's being worked on. Um, so we invite everybody to, to join us. Um, it's uh, running a pretty simple Fedora Linux. Uh, it's got an Intel compatible processor. Uh, it's running X. Is it it's running now? Yes. Um, it's running X. You have a Matchbox window manager and a new desktop environment called Sugar, which is actually implemented in Python using GTK and Cairo as a renderer. So it's uh, really cool stuff. Um, um, I think we can, can use a lot of help still. So if, you, uh, if I press this button, you can see um, on this little screen pretty much the same that I, I have been running over here. Um, and for example, um, this interface, which is not exactly that simple to see right now. Um, okay. Um, this is uh, the, the sugar interface um, there, there is a ring of applications that you can see here. Um, you can change your zoom mode. Uh, so I'm zooming out now. So this is me and my 
uh, friends in the in the mesh network. Um, so these little ears here are actually Wi-Fi antenna. Um, so we have a mesh node work in there. Um, so um, the the software is cool. The the uh, hardware is very cool. Um, you should. Take a look uh, if you if you can up at the Wikimedia thing, and actually I think we are giving away developer boards for this thing at this conference um, for a proposal. So go to the uh, CCC uh, website, um, the event website. Uh, there is a call for proposals for cool project idea for activities that you could do on this laptop. And I'm not sure if SJ is in this room. No, I don't think so. Um, but he's up at the Wikimedia booth and will take these proposals or just send them. Okay, that's it. It's too bad that we only just get started with these interesting things. I would like to see more of that. So where do we get in contact with you? On the lightning talk page, there is a entry for my uh, with my email. No? All right, but okay. you're around somewhere? Um, I'm only around here today, so if if you meet me, just just talk to me. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, danke. So thank you for that. Next on the list is Peter Stuger. He will tell us about the Linux BIOS. And you're prepared? Yep. Connected? Good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Linux BIOS. What is Linux BIOS? Linux BIOS is a minimal hardware initialization software required uh, for Linux to boot. No, it isn't. It does the minimal hardware initialization required for Linux to boot. It does not offer legacy interrupt services. It started as a project at the LANL, Los Alamos National Laboratory, in '99. Uh, they have a lot of supercomputing stuff going on there. They have thousands of nodes. They don't want to do CMOS setup on thousands of nodes. They don't want keyboard error press F1 to continue errors on thousands of nodes. So they decided to start developing an alternative. Version 1 of Linux BIOS had support for about 100 mainboards. Version 2 support for about 50. Version 3 is just starting since a couple of months ago. Vendors are making new boards much faster than we can add support for them in Linux BIOS for a number of reasons. What are the key features and um, how does, what does the design look like? Uh, Linux BIOS is legacy free. There's nearly no assembly code in there because people are better at C code and yeah, assembly is not that fun. Linux BIOS does its initial, uh, initialization things and then it hands over to a payload which can be any number of things. It can be Linux, which uh, either is the final kernel that the system will be running off of. It can also be just an intermediate BIOS kernel because Linux can, since a version back, execute another Linux kernel, which means that the BIOS could use all available drivers in Linux to access the final boot uh, kernel, the final system kernel. That means Wi-Fi, that means weird storage, InfiniBand, etc., etc. The payload can also be Grub2, it can be Philo. Uh, Philo is a small, simple bootloader uh, developed to support booting from local media because Grub2 wasn't there yet. Uh, I don't know what the current state is, but I still use Philo, it works fine. You can also use Etherboot or GPXE to boot from network. Adlow is a project that combined with Box, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's an uh, emulator for the legacy interrupt services found in, um, in older BIOSes that can be used to boot legacy operating systems. Windows 2000 has been done. You can also use Open Firmware as a payload, which is what the OLPC machine is using. Very fast booting. Um, they need to work on that on the OLPC, obviously, because it's not there yet, but the record is three seconds from power on to login screen. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. All configuration is done from user space. There's no configuration utility in the 
in the boot process, which makes it much less error prone. Okay, so potential for Linux BIOS, you could possibly consider SSH into your BIOS. You can uh, consider authenticated booting. Uh, you could uh, do tricks with TPM, Trusted um, Platform Management, whatever it stands for. Perhaps using virtualization, because you're the BIOS, you get first say in what the machine does. So that's nice. Uh, the OLPC, they're planning to use automatic, uh, automatic authenticated BIOS updates distributed uh, out to the machines from a central, central place. Use cases. OLPC, of course, great example. Um, they chose to go with Linux BIOS basically because it was the only option. Flexibility and performance of Linux BIOS is unmatched by any commercial BIOS vendors. The OLPC, in order to conserve power, it's going to suspend and resume a lot, many, many times a second, and um, ACPI is just too slow. OLPC uses open firmware, as I said. Embedded systems, of course, it's attractive to have the fast boot times for them. Your systems may be using Linux BIOS soon. It's an uh, open source alternative, and uh, the next BIOS generation, or uh, what you want to call it, EFI, it has network drivers, and we've been hearing some scary stuff about data retention, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to want EFI to, to control my system for booting. All right, I'm going to speed up then. Uh, version 3, it's more modular, it has more flexible code, it's more extensible, it uses kconfig, which means you can do make menu config to set the options. Uh, for Linux BIOS, you have had to use text files before, it was a mess. Uh, we want to be legacy free to replace all the buggy tables and ACPI stuff that doesn't work anyway. V3 has a requirement that the CPU does cache as RAM for practical reasons. Testing infrastructure, there's a great testing infrastructure, which means that each single commit gets tested on actual hardware. Uh, there, it also produces downloadable binaries. We need your help to test on hardware that we don't have access to ourselves. Please help. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm not done yet. <laughs> and there's a demo too. We need more developer resources. Please help out. Chips and documentation is hard to come by. If you're in a position, please snag Intel and NVIDIA because they don't give out any docs to small players. AMD, on the other hand, are being very, very helpful, so um, please support them. Please send us info from your laptop, LSPCI, and as root run DMID code. Demo. <laughs> Do you want to demo? Yeah. Okay, as you can see, it's booting. It's booting quickly. There's sound soon uh, loading the kernel. This is a um, VIA EPIA board that I picked up a while ago. It's a 600 megahertz. And it, there it's up, and there's sound. Should be sound. No sound. Yeah, anyway, that's the demo. Check out the website linuxbias.org, the emailing list linuxbias at linuxbias.org, or meet with me or Stefan Reinauer at the DJ somewhere in the BCC cafeteria after this lightning talk session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Makes you wonder why you need an operating system on a BIOS at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just SSH into it. <laughs> I have to see this. So, that was that. So next on the list is Sebastian, showing us something about XSPF. So please get connected. By the way, I would like to ask you um, to comment, to give us some uh, feedback on the website. There's now a button you can click on whatever talk and give some feedback. Please make use of this. It's nice to get some feedback after half a year, but then it's, you know, it's just between everything. Uh, we would like to see some online feedback there. So please do make use of this feature. Thank you. Okay, ready? Good. Hello. Um, hello, my name is uh, Sebastian Pippin, and I'm going to talk about um, XSPF today. Um, 
Access PF stands for um, XML Shareable Playlist Format. And um, you can um, imagine it as um, take um, the M3U or PLS Playlist Format, um, change it to XML and add a ton of cool features, formally define it, and what you get out in the end is Access PF. Um, it's uh, an open standard, which means uh, anybody can obtain and implement um, this uh, specification without paying any fees. Um, it's got support for uh, embedded metadata, um, which means you can, um, uh, you can add uh, information like um, track title or um, artist uh, for each track. Um, um, it's suited for both uh, local and remote files, uh, so you can use it for your uh, online streams and your um, local music collection. Um, um, it's also suited both for music and video. Um, it's cross-platform, so one and the same playlist will play on uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, or uh, um, none at all. Um, um, you can uh, uh, even have uh, several locations for the very same track, for example, a low and a high quality version. Um, uh, even more crazy, you can have tracks without any locations, so, um, so um, two people can listen to um, the same track without sharing the file for it, um, just uh, by knowing what track it is. Um, and um, X, um, XSPF is also extensible. Um, which means you could um, add um, a DJ extension, uh, something like, um, hey, play this part of the song um, three times um, in sequence, um, or only this, uh, these two seconds, um, or ten. Um, so, so who does uh, currently speak XSPF? Um, there is uh, websites like Last F. M, which you probably know of uh, Audio Scrubbler. Um, there is WebJ.org, which is a, a site for um, playlist sharing. Um, um, there is software like um, VLC, like um, BMPX, which stands for um, the Experimental um, Beat Media Player, which is a successor of XMMS. Um, there is Music Player. Uh, which is a um, uh, very popular um, MP3 play, you can, uh, written in Flash, that you can just plug into your website and have uh, an offer uh, music to all your visitors. Um, there's uh, libraries for um, several major programming languages like C++, Java, Perl, PHP, and Ruby. Um, I am the author of the first one, of Lipspiff, and uh, of the um, validator uh, down here. So you can also uh, validate if, your, um, if the playlist that you create or some tool has created um, is valid to the specification. You can um, match it on, uh, online using the validator or offline using Scheme files. Um, and we already found errors in, uh, in public websites using these validators. Um, as you can see, XSPF is really coming, and you can be part of it. You all. Um, so we need your help. You could uh, spread the word. You could um, improve support where it already is. Um, you could add support where it's still missing. Like you could uh, take an existing library and uh, integrate it into an existing product or uh, create a new library um, for um, a language that has not uh, support yet. Um, yeah, um, that's mainly it, and um, thanks uh, for your time and attention, and um, if you want to contact me, uh, talk about XSPF, uh, I hope this t-shirt will help me, but uh, I was uh, stupid enough not to uh, make any contact info on this. Um, yeah, just, uh, I will be uh, up uh, in front if you have any questions. Thank you. He beat me to it. I was just about to ring the bell, but there goes. Half a minute saved. On it goes. Next thing from MIB. Where is he? There you are. Please come up stage. And uh, right, this is about 
Hacktivismo, and I have no idea what it is all about, so I cannot tell you. Hmm. I think we're being hacked here. <laughs> Looks like it. Hi everyone, I'm MIB, I'm a member of Hacktivismo, the Ninja Strike Force, and Culture Cow Communications. I'm here to give you a very quick rundown about Hacktivismo, who we are, and what we've been doing uh, during the past months. The reason why I'm doing this is because I would like to get as many people who are present here involved as possible. Okay, what is Hacktivismo? We've been active for a couple of years. We're a special operations group sponsored by the Cow. We consist of hackers, lawyers, human rights workers, and other sexy deviants. Uh, what we are doing is mainly creating technology uh, to uh, improve human rights uh, and to uh, give people the ability to uh, have free access to information and to uh, help them uh, express themselves in a safe manner uh, when they're living uh, under uh, a repressed regime. Uh, during the years, we've been working with organizations such as the EFF, uh, Human Rights in China, uh, Citizen Lab, just to give a couple of examples. Our last project, our last release was Torpark, which is um, basically Mozilla Firefox with uh, Tor installed. You can install it on your computer, but you can also uh, run it from a USB stick. A couple of months before that, uh, we released ScatterChat. That's a friendly fork of game um, with both Tor uh, integrated in it and very heavy encryption. Um, in and on itself, these technologies are not um, special. I mean, they exist, but what we do is enable uh, normal users, users who have no technical background, to just install it, plug and play, it works, uh, and they can do what they have to do without ha uh, the need for special technical uh, knowledge. Uh, we do things in other fields as well, for example, uh, Human Rights in China, uh, Amnesty International. Uh, we work with these organizations, we help them help other people uh, in the respective countries to keep safe when they're doing uh, their work. Uh, we help them to uh, secure their data, which is very important. Um, we also did, for example, the Gulag campaign, which was to uh, raise awareness about uh, Google cooperating with China. Um, what we think it's very important to raise awareness about these issues so that uh, people know about these people who are not interested in technology that they know about these issues and we've succeeded in this. Um, before that we also created Camera Shy which is a stigno stigmographical uh, application. It puts data in uh, JPEGs and GIFs uh, and when you have the correct keys it automatically scans uh, for the content. You can uh, click on a list box and you get what's inside of the picture. Uh, we are currently working at a new version uh, which will also include uh, video streams, uh, doc files, everything you can think of which is, uh, on a large, which is present on a large scale on the internet. Uh, you'll be able to hide uh, data in it. Um, so I'd say uh, come and join us. You'll see the world. You'll fight evil monsters. You'll uh, save maidens, uh, you'll win valuable prizes. Uh, we have very bright people in this room and there's people in need, not only in China, but right back here at home, uh, we are in danger of losing our rights to encrypt. We are in danger of losing our rights to privacy and we should fight right here and right now to keep those rights. We have a responsibility for ourselves, but also for the people that come after us. There's not only Hacktivismo, you can also, for example, help projects such as the Tor project, 
they are doing very valuable work. You can also uh, just step up to Amnesty International, for example, and tell them, yeah, I know uh, about computer security. How can I help you? Really, they need your help. And we do too. Uh, our website is www.hacktivismo.com. You can reach me at mib at hacktivismo.com or you can just uh, come up and talk with me. I won't bite unless you want me to. Um, I'm here for the rest of the Congress. Thank you for your attention. Now, just to close off, my lovely assistants from Ninja Strike Force, Elliot Pank and Devilish, they'll be handing out candy. Why? Because you've all been very bad boys and girls and we love you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure this will be remembered for a while. We should really have another camera pointing this way. Maybe you can turn around the camera. They're just passing it on down the line. Very nice. <laughs> so that was hacktivismo.com. Please join the fun. Ne well, time is really getting close. We have two more talks on the list. Thanks for that. So here's Kai Kunze. You're already set up. Okay. Here we go. Uh, thank you. Hmm? Phone? The laptop, the the laptop, laptop, the laptop what's done? Is it? No, yes. <laughs> uh. It is very, very secure. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, my name is Kai Kunze. I'm a researcher at the University of Passau, and I just thought I'd give you some um, state of the art uh, developments in the variable computing area, just as you know, there's a quite a diverse audience. I thought I'd quickly motivate wearable computing and where I'm coming from. I hope you can, if you have some background, just bear with me for a second, I'll be done. Um, basically, the idea of, you know, calming us will take us from where we are today. So this is actually an unstaged picture of my desk. Um, <laughs> to hopefully what, you know, Mark Weiser envisioned in Park and so on, to this beautiful site where computing is integrated everywhere uh, and it actually helps us without, invisibly, uh, um, without us actually recognizing uh, to act upon real life problems and processes. So for this, actually, okay, the computer has to know what's going on in the real world. So, and this is done then of course, over fixed infrastructure sensing, so, you know, microphones, um, cameras, and stuff like that, and of course, and this is where I'm kind of focusing on my work or our work at the University of Passau is uh, variable computing. Uh, probably uh, not like that, but, you know, more unobtrusive, nice. What you see here is the Cubic. It's a Belt Integrated Computer from ETH Zürich. It's a full-fledged Linux PC, yeah. I'm actually also wearing one. It's a full-fledged Linux PC. <laughs> Stop pointing at me. Yeah, anyways, uh, it's a full-fledged Linux PC. It runs Debian, and yeah, it's kind of nice. It has Bluetooth, it has a USB host, and yeah, other devices, so basically, you know, there's this Nike sensor coming out, and uh, so basically sensing on the body. And what do we want to do with it is support higher level activ activities. So in everyday life, in sports and leisure, work and collaboration, and also of course in healthcare. Um, now, how does this work? Or just giving you some, some idea. This is actually an, an old video, but I just want to show you. So this is the Cubic. It's, com uh, it's connected over Bluetooth to a Nessalometer on the hand, and this is just a workbench monitoring thing. So what you see here is Georg, a colleague of mine, and he just basically, um, the Cubic actually does the recognition work, and it sends it over to TC, over TCP, and then you see, okay, it recognizes hammering, it recognizes screwing, or uh, actually uh, things like that. What you can do with this is, you know, video annotation, or, or also you can remind uh, uh, a worker that he forgot an important uh, step. 
during your work. Yeah, more more fun things. So going towards uh, healthcare and so on. Uh, a friend of mine, Oliver Amft, uh, at ETH, was doing some automatic dietary monitoring. What you do there is basically you use an in-ear microphone and you can actually recognize chewing sounds. So you know how often somebody is actually eating or drinking something. And uh, actually, you can also distinguish what somebody is eating. Because, for example, fruit, like apples, make a quite distinct sound from potato chips, for example. <laughs> Yeah, but it won't help you to recognize if you drink low-fat milk or, you know, <laughs> so on. Uh, yeah, and um, continuing, of course, uh, gaming also. This is kind of a Wii 2.0 or uh, whatever you want to see. That's uh, Parking Master. It's basically the idea behind this was... Uh, at, this is at the uh, at the informatics day in University of Passau. This was actually a project we did for a tutorial at uh, ESWIC at the Sympo International Symposium for Variable Computing, uh, for compu uh, variable computing, also with ETH. What you see here is uh, basically you stand outside of the car and you try to uh, help the car park. So you actually and you actually use uh, real gestures. So you would use uh, more or less uh, in a real world too. I'll try to get the demo running. I tried to get it running for today, but uh, yeah, somehow it didn't work correctly. But maybe catch me over the next two or three days. Um, okay, um, the thing, okay, um, the thing here is basically how this is done is we use some, uh, our own software. This is basically uh, over collaborations with ETH and also Lancaster and so on. We worked on a toolbox that's C++. We're currently in process of trying to open source it and here I also get to the point more or less. So, you know, if you find those application cases and so on interesting and talk to me later on, we're, uh, yeah, in the, couple, in the next couple of months, we will try to, to open source this, uh, this context recognition uh, software. And yeah, also if you're in general interested in uh, variable computing and body hacking and stuff like that, I have tons of nice videos and other stuff. So come and see me later on. Thank you very much. Here's my contact ID. Yeah. Yes, internet everywhere, that's much better than laptop everywhere. And uh, when you can wear these kind of things, so they actually detect when you are screwing. <laughs> I think... I about that too. I mean, no. A photo, yes. Uh, but, um, you know, you can probably connect this up to your blog, so everybody will be notified when you score or something. At the game, I mean, of course. That could be uh, looking very nicely. So, <laughs> you can ex even count scores. Hey, what's your score? Okay, here we go. This is for the last talk. This is Benjamin, and he's all set up, and here we go. Hello. My talk is about games and having fun in ways that we're not supposed to have. The game I'm talking about is Natchek. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, I can't imagine anyone here, but still. The game NetHack is a roguelike game where you crawl through a dungeon, kill monsters, and have to find an amulet, which is more or less well guarded. One thing is, um, there is a few monsters in there which uh, split when, uh, when they are being hit. So you hit the monster and suddenly you have two of them with uh, less hit points, but still two of them. This can be abused in a way so that you have infinite of these monsters. Every monster, when killed, gives experience, gives points, and it can give items, which is, in a game like Netech, um, maybe I should say a bit more, you have items like weapons, armor, think World of Warcraft, like this, but only in text mode. You have no graphics. So um, someone told me it was impossible to automate this process, so I made it possible. Uh, what I use there, what do you need to do this? This whole thing is called putting farming because the monster is called a black putting. So we use a little setup like this here. Every zero here defines a boulder which cannot be passed. The at is me, my player. The underscore is an altar to my god. 
And these three spaces are free space where one can move, where one can move. We then wait or create or in some other way make one black padding to appear here in this area. St start to hit it so that it splits. And with a bit of work, we have a few hundred of them but relatively easy in about half an hour. At that point, we can start padding farming. So now, how to automate this? You have, all you have is a keyboard and a connection to a Telnet server. The game can be played on various the servers, Knetrack Alt.org being the most popular one, and the tournament every November. On these servers, you can co simply connect to Telnet, which I used to connect the Perl script to this Telnet stream. I then started to parse every data that came in, including escape characters, color codes, all these things that made people think it was impossible to do this. For, with a bit of regex magic, I started to make it possible, and the end, end result then looked something like this. Every colored uh, letter is a monster, every black P, every blue P is a black padding, and this ad in here is me. <laughs> All this is realized within a, within a Perl script, which has such a high hack value that is probably only maintainable by me and Larry Wall. Uh, which goes on to prove that hack value isn't everything if you want to look at your code again in a few months. I haven't looked at this code in a few months myself, and I'm afraid to do so again. But it still works. I've tested it a few days ago, but unfortunately, the game is no longer running, because, uh, and so I can't show you this script in live right now. A lot of uh, situations are handled, and if the bot encounters some situations it can't handle, it simply stops, which means you can, at this point, pick up the game yourself, continue playing, and then give the bot the command to start up again, and it will return to action. This is the server, netag alt.org. You can just tell it to the server and register a user, which will then look like this. Yeah, con Congress Network is uh, making it difficult for me. Well, while we're waiting, uh, one, one other thing that is nice about this uh, server, you can watch other people playing, you can send them messages, which can be particularly nasty if someone wants to play some so-called conducts in which he wants to adhere to some restrictions, self-imposed restrictions. One of those is illiterate, so he can't read anything. The moment he reads something, he has broken this conduct and usually wants to kill his game character right now. And a lot of people have already, already been forced to quit this way. So it's not that easy. The game sounds quite easy. I've been playing for five years uh, before I beat it for the first time. So if you want to play, use Telnet to NetHack Alt.org, register a user, and watch for Blind Coder with me. Thanks for your attention. If you want to contact me, I'm here on DECT 2307, and other kinds of contact information are placed on the wiki page for the, for the Lightning Talks. Thank you very much. We are dead on time, which is nice. So um, I hope you will give us some feedback uh, via the wiki page, and I hope to see you tomorrow again when we will have scheduled for 11 talks. So see you then. Thank you.